Ryan is still in Colorado. Uh, they successfully pulled off the civet wedding yesterday. <laughs> Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our beautiful weather. And we thank you for your favorable wind and keeping that smoke away from our valley. We ask that you uh, protect our firefighters uh, as they continue to battle these fires. And uh, uh, we ask that you continue to look over, over us and be with the civics and voice and the travel tomorrow. Keep them safe.
and Jamie did lots of stuff uh, working around the property and the, they were very well loved by the community there. Um, so I want to tell you about a couple of experiences we had that were pretty powerful. Um, one is that uh, I worked in the shop and um, my task was pretty similar to Elise and Joanna's where we were assembling parts, but um, I had a really hard time with that. I'm a pretty active, creative, people-oriented guy and to <coughs> sit, sit at a desk and assemble handicapped equipment <coughs> parts was really, really hard for me. And uh, everybody else in the family was kind of thriving and I was really suffering. And uh, so that was extra pressure because we were seriously considering <coughs> joining this group and one of the things that uh, they require is that you do whatever work you're given instead of you, you know, choose a career path and you do that. So I wanted to see if I could do that and every day it seemed like it was worse and worse and I was suffering more and more and I tried all kinds of things. Um, to try to make it better at eating a snack and memorizing things at my station and taking a job beforehand. And I asked people to pray for me and um, one day I just kind of uh, had a sense of kind of brokenness and in the midst of that um, I felt like I was given a gift of I could, I could tolerate that work and I could be okay working any kind of work. And I don't know how that happened exactly. It just felt like a gift was given. And then um, we went and spoke with the elders and asked them to pray for us because it felt like, wow, you know, now everybody in the family is doing well with this experience. Maybe we should seriously consider it. And um, they prayed, got back with us and said, we think you should go home and pour yourself into the next phase of life and, and don't try to pursue this community anymore. And you'd think that we'd be sad and upset or like rejected by that, but <laughs> what they had actually noticed was that we'd been following them and in relationship with them for 20 years and I think they were really given the wisdom that we needed to kind of let that go because um, their belief is that if someone's supposed to join their community, that it's a calling and that you know without a doubt and that that's given to you and it's not, you can't make it happen, you can't strive to accomplish it and they could tell we were not 100%. Um, and so when they said that, we felt a great sense of peace and we let it go. And um, a lot has happened since then, and there's kind of more to the story, but I, I wanted to let you guys know that we are in a little bit of culture shock coming back, because it's really different way of life. Like, we, I feel like a fragmented, super individualized person compared to them, just because they cooperate so deeply with everything. Um, and I, wanted to save the rest of the story for when uh, everybody's back. So I'll pause there and we'll do it to be continued next week.
stand together and worship. I don't know about you guys, I'm feeling a little like I need a really good stretch or something this morning to kind of get going, so I'm trying to use some energy in worship, huh? Get the energy up a little bit. Praise you when I'm grieving. Praise you every season of the storm. 
Oh 
small child you got lost when you were wandering away from your mother at the grocery store or um, you got lost in the woods one time. I remember when I was uh, about 19 or 20 years old a few friends and I and my dog Dixie went on a hike out in the, the woods. Actually we went backpacking. When we showed up in the parking lot there was about six inches of snow on the ground. So not the ideal situation for going backpacking out in the woods but we we're excited. We we're enthusiastic about the day so we, we took off hiking. When we got to our spot up in the mountains, we, we found a nice level spot. And so we set up a fire, we, we took off our gear and set up the tent. And we noticed the sun was setting on the west side of the mountain. And we said, man, wouldn't it be cool if we could go catch the sunset setting over there? And there was a lake over there and everything. So we, we set all our stuff down and we walked over to the far side of this mountain. And as you know, when the sun sets, it gets dark. <laughs> So, you know, we watch this glorious sunset on the water. It's real beautiful. And then all of a sudden we look at each other like, oh my gosh, it's dark. And we're on the other side of the mountain. And we have none of our things. I have my dog Dixie. I'm all worried about her. So, so we start walking back. And I think in between us all, we're thinking in our minds like, I think we're lost. You know, that panicky, scared feeling like I wandered away from where we should have been. And I got lost. So we're walking back and I'm praying in my head, okay, Lord. Please help us find it. And I think we're just trying to stay cool, but almost to the point of saying, okay, what are we going to do? And so we're walking back, and finally we find our, our foot tracks in the snow. Thank God there was snow. And we actually had passed our campground by quite a ways, and we turned back around and, and found our spot. But how often as Christians do we wander off from where we're supposed to be, and, and we go and get lost? Maybe, it, it, maybe it's even something beautiful. We, we go and look at the sunset. And we get lost. This morning we're going to look at a nation, the nation of God, who, who wandered so far off from God and was so lost. Yet God in His grace, He calls them back. Luke 19.10, it says that Jesus says, Look, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Which is good news. Let's pray this morning. God, we love You, Lord. We just thank You for allowing us to gather here and, and worship Your holy, holy name, Lord. Father, I just pray that you would be here with us by your spirit, God. Lord, I pray that you would transform us and, and Lord, even just call us back from our, our endless wanderings, Lord. And Lord, um, this morning, Lord, we're humbled with the fact that we are prone to wander. So Lord, I pray that you would just return us today by your spirit, God. And Lord, just show us your mercy and your grace. We love you, God, and we just uh, invite you here in Jesus' name. Amen. 
you guys have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 2. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Bible. We'll be here in chapter 2 of Jeremiah for quite a ways. So hang tight. Just to kind of give us a, a background and set up the stage for what was going on in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah was a prophet, a prophet of God, and he was ministering to Judah and Jerusalem right up until the time of the uh, Babylonian exile, when King Nebuchadnezzar came in and as a form of judgment, God used King Nebuchadnezzar to take the Israelites out of their land because they were disobedient. And he reigned during the, the reigns of King Josiah, who's actually a great king who was, who was a reformer and who took the nation of Israel and, and brought it back to the glory of God. Then he also reigned during the, the times of Jehoiakim, his son, and Zedekiah, his son, who were, who were evil in the sight of the Lord. And the crazy thing is about Judah and Jerusalem at this time is that they had walked so far from God. It says in Jeremiah eleven thirteen that he says, look, Judah and Jerusalem, the amount of gods you have is the same as the amount of cities you have in your town. The amount of altars that you've set up is the amount of streets that you have in Jerusalem. They would set up these high places, they would call them up in the mountainsides, where they'd burn incense to all these false gods. And just to give you an idea and a picture of these gods, one of the gods' name was Melech, a false god that they would worship. And they literally would bring their babies to sacrifice in fire to this god. And this is God's chosen people we're talking about here. So this is the stage, this is, this is the area that, that Jeremiah is, is ministering into. So look with me in Jeremiah chapter 2, and we're going to be in verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals, your falling after me in the wilderness, through a land not sown. God says, Look, I remember how devoted you were when we were walking through the wilderness. And he's talking about the wilderness out of the Exodus when God brought his people through the desert. And he says, look, I remember how devoted you were. Or another word there is loving kindness. Loving kindness you had for me. And this is a picture of our walk with Christ when we first met Jesus. Do you remember when you first met Jesus and the fire that was set inside your soul? How excited you were and how passionate you were about this new walk? Everything's new. God's made me new. And you've just seen the miraculous right hand of God's power to save you out of a life of sin and darkness. And he says, look, you remember that time. I remember, Israel, when, when you were devoted to me. Because you had just seen my right hand take you from one place and bring you out of the wilderness. Out of bondage to the Egyptians. So this should remind us of, of our walk as Christians when we first start. The devotion and just the zeal for walking after Christ. But this is the turning point. Jump down to verse 4 with me, if you would. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice did your fathers find in me, that they went far from me, and walked after emptiness, and became empty? God says, My people have turned, and they've walked after emptiness. Now, what he's talking about here is specifically they're walking after the idols. Remember, we talked about all the foreign gods that they, they serve and worship. But when we think about idols in our 21st century modern Christian mind, we think of these devilish little carvings of wood and, and gold and, and metal, these little statues. But the reality is, this is sharp. An idol is anything or anyone that you love more than Jesus. Let me say that again. An idol is anything or anyone that you love more than Jesus. What are you walking after this morning? What are you pursuing with your life? And is it empty? And I want to say this, that not all pursuits are, are evil or vain or empty. But there's a couple things I want to look at that they might be if. Your pursuits might be empty if they are more important than your pursuit of Jesus Christ. You might ask yourself this, this morning, am I putting Jesus first? Is He my first thought in the morning? Am I seeking Him before all my other pursuits? And it's so easy to wander away from this as Christians. Like the hymnal says, I am prone to wander. Prone to leave the Lord I love. You know, it's so easy to wake up in the day and say, you know what, I think I'm going to walk this way instead. Check yourself. You might be walking after emptiness. 
Is your top priority? So number two would be this. They might be an empty pursuit if they are of the flesh and not the spirit. So even a church thing, even a church something that you're, you're serving or something can actually be of the flesh and not the spirit. What do I mean by that? I mean that if it's a self-serving, something that's not about serving Jesus, but it's about yourself, you actually might be in an empty pursuit. And you might ask yourself, is this of the flesh or the spirit? And, and you don't have to question long. God will reveal if what you're pursuing is of Him or of your flesh. So often I'm caught in this. Where, where I'm pursuing emptiness and it seems like something good, but God will reveal by His Spirit, hey, that's not really of me. That's of your flesh. A good way to check if you have any hidden idols under the, under the cover, so to speak, is ask yourself this question. Where do I turn to in times of trouble or trial or loneliness or depression? In those times, where are you turning? Is it the refrigerator or is it Facebook or is it texting or is it a relationship even? Maybe you turn to go to the mall and go shopping. Now, all these things aren't inherently bad. We know that these things aren't evil. But if they're above your pursuit of Jesus Christ, then they might be a foreign God that you're serving. And I think as Christians, it's so important to call this into, into light often because, like I said, we think about idols as these foreign, devilish-looking things that have been carved out of wood, metal, or stone. But as Christians, we are so prone, prone to walk after those empty things and not even realize it. So check yourself this morning. Are you walking after emptiness? And here's the reality. God says, look, they walked after emptiness and they became empty. Now it's like, well, yeah, duh, imagine that. You walk after emptiness and you get empty. You know that feeling when, man, I really want that new phone that's out. Oh, I've been really wanting to get that new fishing rod or that new rifle or that new car. And then you go and get it and it doesn't bring any satisfaction. Or it lasts for the day and then you go to bed and wake up and it's gone already. I remember a couple years ago, I was at Big Five. I love going to Big Five. All the knives and the guns. <laughs> love it. The guys don't know what I'm So I see in there, there's a crossbow up on the wall. It's all displayed. It's beautiful. And I don't need a crossbow at all. I'm, I'm not going out and hunting. I just see a crossbow. I'm thinking, man, I want that thing. So I buy it. I've used it probably four times for a matter of 15 minutes apiece. And it just sits in my room now. And it, but you see what I mean? You get the illustration that these things that we pursue are so empty. And once we get them, we realize that, wow, this has left me empty. It brings us to the point that God is the only one that will fill our satisfaction. God is the only one that can internally satisfy our souls in a way that no other thing or person can. Read with me in verse 6 and 7. Let's continue on. They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Who led us through the wilderness? Through a land of deserts and of pits. Through a land of drought and of deep darkness. Through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things. But you came and defiled my land. My inheritance, you made an abomination. So this morning, we think about the Israelites and how far they had turned away from God. And it's so easy for me to wonder, how did they wander so far away from the God who had just rescued them in such a powerful way out of the Egyptians' hand? We remember how the story goes. God raises up this awesome leader, Moses, and he calls forth. He says, Pharaoh, let my people go. And God smote the Egyptians with like all these plagues. And he leads his people out through a, a, an ocean of a sea of water on dry land. Each day they would wake up, they'd have manna ready to go. I always picture that as their frosted flakes in the morning. Everything you need in that little <coughs> manna package. He even rained down quail for them. And even at one point, he would give them water that gushed out of a rock. And we think, how, how after they saw that power of God, would they turn so far in such an opposite direction and walk after such emptiness? But let me put this forward to you. We as Christians have a much greater exodus than these Israelites did. We have an exodus that is much more profound than, than Moses. God didn't just raise up a man. He raised up the God-man to lead us out of, sin, of slavery and sin. And he, he literally went to the cross and took on our sin. We were plunged through the Red Sea of His blood. 
and made clean. And, and the shackles of bondage and, and slavery from our oppressors were broken off. So why do we go on? It's so easy to, to do as Christians. Maybe this morning your prayer would be, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. God, honestly, Lord, sometimes I forget that you have done such an awesome work in my life. Sometimes I forget, God, that you have delivered me by the power of the cross. I forget the, the grace and the mercy that you give me every single morning. So God, restore that to my soul. Lord, bring me back from wandering. I know that feeling. It's too easy to walk away from the Lord. Look down in Jeremiah 2.13. We're going to skip a few verses. Because it all gets wrapped up here in verse 13. God says this. One of my favorite pictures and analogies in the Bible is right here. It says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now a fountain, a spring of living water we know is, is moving or running water. Implying that it's fresh, it's, it's clear. And in your mind you can picture this crystal clear fountain of water and it's flowing out. It's ready to drink as it is. But God says, you've replaced me, which I am clear and fresh and refreshing. I will satisfy your soul for a cistern of water. And a cistern was pretty much these big holes that they would dig in the ground out of the soft limestone in the deserts. And they would just catch rainwater because the land was so dry they'd often have drought, so they would catch rainwater. And you can picture this water had probably all kinds of green, green slime on the top, and there's probably flies that fall into there, and even a nearby animal walking by and doing his thing. And so God says, Look, you've forsaken me, the crystal clear stream of water, for a cistern of water that breaks and, and it seeps out water. It doesn't even hold water. I think this is such a beautiful picture of what we do as Christians. Like you said in the beginning in verse 5, look, you've, you've walked after emptiness. And you, be, you became empty. Look with me in John chapter 7. Now in John chapter 7 at this time, there was something called the Festival of Booths or Tabernacles. And it was commemorating or celebrating the time when the Israelites were out in the desert. And they would wander out in the desert for the 40 years. And they had set up the booths. So they were celebrating that fact. So I kind of think about this as a big camp out in Jerusalem. And they would set up these booths and kind of do a big camp out. And all the Jewish men were required to go there and to celebrate. So as we know, Jesus was there. But like we see in scripture, Jesus is kind of under the cover, kind of sneaking around and doing these, these awesome works here at the festival. Because it was close to his crucifixion. Now, the most awesome part about this is that during the Feast of Booths, there was a, usually a drought. By that time of the year, it was September or October. In the desert, there was a deep drought at that time. And so on the seventh day of this festival, everyone would meet at the, the temple. And there was a priest that would go down to the southern border of the city, and he would gather water out of a pitcher. He'd go back to the temple, and he'd pour it on the altar. And he'd do this seven times. Go back and forth seven times. And what this was symbolizing is, yeah, Lord, we, we plead for rain. We need rain for our crops, and, and Lord, that you would just refresh this land. But also it was a picture of Ezekiel and Isaiah's vision of water flowing forth from the temple. I don't know if you guys remember that, but God prophesied that, look, in the future there will be water that pours out from the temple. And so they're looking forward to that day. So this sets the stage for what Jesus is about to say, one of the most profound and, and deep pictures that has ever been painted in Scripture, in my opinion. So read with me in verse 37 of chapter 7. It says, Now on the last day, the day where they were pouring out the water, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So I can see Jesus almost standing next to the guy that's pouring out the water. And him saying to the people, look, if you're thirsty, I'm the one that's going to satisfy you. Because remember, Jesus isn't just talking into a land that is dry and arid from drought. He's talking to souls that are thirsty. He's talking to people that need their thirst quenched. And he says, look, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. Don't you love how simple our God is for us? Making it so easy. He doesn't say, look, I need you to have 
exact correct doctrine. I need you to have studied theology for four years and have mastered your seminary. He says simply, come to me and dream. Are you thirsty this morning? Maybe you're just in a place of, of just a dry, desert, airy place where you need a drink of the Lord. God will offer it to you in His Son Christ. Read with me in verse 39. It says, But this He spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in Him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus is talking about this living water that is a spirit. And that should remind you of Jeremiah 2.13 where God says, Look, I'm the fountain of living water. Jesus, in a sense, He claims to be God here. He says, Look, I'm the one that's going to offer you living water. And it's the Spirit of God that comes forth from Him. Isn't that awesome? Yes. As, as New Testament believers, that we've, we've been given the, the gift and the blessing of having the Spirit of God come inside and, and quench our thirst. Jesus says at the, at the well with the woman in John chapter 4, Look, I have a well that will well up in you to eternal life. So the question is the same. Are you thirsty this morning? Maybe you're at a point this morning where I've never tasted of that water. I've never really come, like Jesus said, just simply came to Jesus and believed in Him. Have you this morning? Have you ever came to Jesus and just said, you know what, Jesus, I trust you. I, I really believe in you. Or maybe this morning you're in a place where, you know, I'm a Christian and, and I've just been wandering. I've been out walking after emptiness and, and, and you know what, God, I feel it. I, I am empty. So maybe this morning your prayer would say, Lord, fill me with your spirit, God. May I be, my, may my soul be quenched by your spirit. And maybe, uh, maybe today would be that day where you would just draw near to Jesus and say, God, I want you to fill me. See, it's a simple message. The gospel is that we come to Jesus and believe him. Sometimes it, it seems so complicated, it seems so complex, but the, the basic foundation line is this, that we come to Jesus and believe in Him, and He will satisfy us eternally. So as we conclude, um, I just want to restate the question, what are you walking after this morning? W what is your life about? What are, what are your life pursuits for? And are your pursuits more important than your pursuit of Jesus Christ? Are you seeking things... In a more intense and a more valuable way than you are of Jesus. Or number two, are your pursuits of the flesh or the spirit? Check yourself this morning. Am I pursuing things of the spirit of the kingdom of God? Or, or am I pursuing things that maybe aren't of him and are of my own flesh? This morning, come to Jesus and drink the rivers of living water. Let's pray. Oh God, I just... I'm so blessed, Lord, to hear of your promises, Lord, that you offer us living water, God, that is fresh and clear and pure to drink, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would this morning, God, we would just return to you, Lord, from walking from our emptiness. And God, I want to be the first one to say, I am sorry. Lord, please forgive me for walking after my emptiness and, and those things that leave me dry. But God, we come to you asking you to fill our hearts with your spirit. Lord, may we be satisfied this morning in your grace and in your spirit, God. I just love you, Lord, and I just pray that you would help us to return to you, Lord. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand together and worship. Hey.
are the King of kings, Almighty, Almighty.
stand together one more time. We praise Jesus for the ultimate reason we praise him, that he gave his life for us. You spoke and worlds were formed. You breathed and life was born. You knew that one day you would come. So far from heaven's throne, and clothed in human form, you showed the world the Father's love. And you gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away for me. And your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. And you gave, you gave your life away for me. Oh. Live a sinless life, yet you were crucified. You bought our freedom on the cross. Forsaken for our sin, you died and rose again. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God. And you came.